Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm uh, Alexander Cairo. I teach here in the College of Islamic Studies in Doha, uh, HBKU, and it is my pleasure to chair uh, the first session of today's um, uh, conference, the second day of an exciting conference on Islamic virtue ethics. Um, we had three uh, panelists scheduled. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Faraz Sheikh is unable to join us today. Uh, which means we will have uh, two presentations and more time for discussions. Um, our first speaker, I will introduce each speaker in turn. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Fariel Bohafa, who received her PhD from Georgetown University and is now currently a senior research associate at the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. Her research interests lie in Arabic philosophy and Islamic sciences with a focus on law, ethics, and rhetoric and poetics. Um, in her first book entitled, Economy of Contingency in Ethics, Law, and Truth, Ibn Rushd's Moral Philosophy, which we're very much looking forward to, uh, uh, Dr. Bohafa identifies a philosophy of law in Ibn Rushd's philosophical and legal works, uh, which not only assesses the epistemological basis of the Islamic system of knowledge, but also admits the necessity of rectifying legal norms to redress ethical deficiencies stemming from the contingency of human actions. Um, today, she will present to us um, on Eretaic theory in Arabic philosophy, the relation between virtue, law, and psychology. Dr. Wahafa, the floor is yours. You'll have um, 20, 25 minutes for your presentation. Uh, thank you. Um... Um, for this lovely uh, um, uh, invitation and for the kind introduction, uh, just a, a, a rectification. I, I think I, um, I should say I'm, I'm, my position changed from senior to just visiting for now. Just, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, it's it's a great uh, opportunity. I must say, for some reason, I cannot share my um, my PowerPoint, so I just sent it to Muna. Um, I will pass you now the presenter for a privilege. You can present it now. Just a I, oh, okay. Now it's okay. So now it works. Okay. So then um, let's see. Okay. Once, sorry, keep me. Yes. Is it working now? Okay. Yes. Uh, can you see the the slides now? Hello. We can. We can. Yes. yes but can. maybe you want to maximize the PowerPoint. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This slide. Perfect. Okay. okay thank, thank you, you again um, um, for the lovely invitation. As I said, uh, my talk um, entitled "Eretic Theory in Ibn Rushd's Philosophy." Uh, is to, to to give the the basis, or uh, one could say, the background for Ibn Rushd's virtue uh, theory, um, focusing on his commentary on the Nicomachean ethics, uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. I sorry, yes, uh, I'd like to f first make very brief remarks on uh, approaches to the study of ethics in Islam, particularly Islamic philosophy, and with a focus on Ibn Rushd. And then I shall move on to kind of lay out the basis for Ibn Rushd's um, ethical theory uh, with a focus on his moral ontology. How does he define the good in relation to the virtues? And then move on to his moral epistemology, um, specifically the epistemology of the science of ethics. And finally, um, the practical aspect of his um, method, which is how do we actualize ethics? Um, and, and um, kind of um, try to discern this relation between virtue, virtues and uh, law. Um, sorry, let me just, okay. So I'd, I'd like to start with this um, um, co uh, quotation from the work of, uh, the important work of Fakhri on um, uh, Islamic ethical theories. Uh, and here I, um, I read the philosophers, he says, whether Neoplatonists like Farabi Aristotelians like Ibn Rushd or Platonists like Razi 
uh, fall into different category altogether, although they do not ignore or deliberately um, disavow the authority of the Quran. Their primary allegiance is to the canons of philosophical evidence as bequeathed by Greek philosophy. Their ethical discussions are sometimes embellished by Quranic quotations in the manner of other Muslim authors, but it is primarily the dictates of syllogistic reasoning that determine the conclusions they arrive at. Um, I must admit that um, there are certain um, questionable um, um, claims in, 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 this, um, in this statement, and I shall um, explain why. Obviously, uh, uh, Fakhri subscribes to this kind of binary view between an objective ethic versus a subjective ethic that is literal or based on, on, on religious um, discourse versus um, rational discourse. And here he frames this idea of allegiance almost like to the Quran or paying, uh, paying lip service to the Quran versus an allegiance to the Greek uh, texts. And specifically, he emphasizes the commitment to rationality and the dictates of syllogistic reasoning. So the question that I uh, that one could raise here, did the philosopher attribute a syllogistic method to ethics? And if so, what kind of method? Because when you look at Arabic logic, syllogistic method have different uh, types, dialectical or rhetorical or um, rational. So that's one important element. But in terms of the issues that I, I would like to raise from this quotation is, it does, in a way, to me at least, suggest the essence of ethics is in the Quran is static and uh, the philosophers could only pay lip service to it. And we do know, actually, from some of the presentation yesterday, specifically uh, uh, the, the first presentation, where you could see that there is a discursive element to ethics in, in the Quran. So, and, and here this, is, this seems to be like, um, it presents the philosophers as if they were torn between two types of truth. Uh, and um, for, for, for my um, uh, position, uh, uh, I mean, from my approach, I think it also undermines the philosopher's active role in theorizing about their, uh, their context, their Islamic context. So the question again is, did the philosopher attribute to ethics a, a, a rational syllogistic method? And in fact, we need to, in, uh, to look into how philosophers pondered about whether we can reach truth about ethics. In fact, an answer can be found to this uh, 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 in um, Shahristani's Nihayat al-Aqdam, where he asserts that the philosopher, um, meaning Averroes uh, or Ibn Rushd, Farabi and Ibn Sina, admit the limitation of the human intellect to reach all intelligibles and incapacity to fulfill their universal well-beings. And this is why um, some uh, asserted, obviously, that law gives are necessary to human existence. In fact, Ibn Rushd admits in the middle commentary of the Nicomachean Ethics, following obviously uh, Aristotle, that ethics cannot be based on the abstraction, rather the beginning of beautiful actions is its manifestation in reality. So then why did Ibn Rushd adhere to this view and how do we actualize then ethics? This is what I'm gonna try to um, outline in my next, uh, in, in the rest of my presentation. So, um, Ibn Rush's moral ontology is discussed, obviously, in his commentary to the Nicomachean Ethics, where he, following Aristotle in Book One, tries to outline the conception of good in relation to ethics and makes an interesting distinction between the good and virtues. So um, here, sorry. And that is because the good is spoken of in substance, as is the case for God and the intellect, which are both good, and it is spoken of in terms of quality, like virtues, in quantities such as justice and in relations such as the beneficial and times, such as the right time and place, like the house and so forth. It is done in most things that exist, by which I mean in relation to the 10 categories. So Ibn Rushd here is basically making an important distinction between the good as a substance or a jawhar and good as a quality. Good as a substance is actually associated to God and the intellect, where good as a, as a quality is associated to the virtues or qada'il. And here he gives examples. So what kind of, uh, in, uh, in relation to the, um, the categories of Aristotle. So in terms of quantity, you have justice. In terms of relation, the ladafa, you have ben the beneficial. 
time and, and, and the time the right time and place is also important to defining um, virtues so good here is associated to the uh, 10 categories and this is obviously an important distinction because when you look into uh, for uh, for even uh, good as a substance has obviously an ontological priority over the categories it's uh, as the term in Arabic is mutaqaddim, whereas existent things that is related to the categories are posterior to substance, they are mutaakhir. And in that sense, obviously, the good in this domain of in relation to God is uh, very is related to God as the first cause, who is the uh, the ultimate good in in the universe, and therefore has a a, a priority, an ontological priority over. The good that is related to virtues, which is rather a relative good, it has particular, it is, it, it, it exists in terms of uh, in relation to category or the quantity or relation, etc. And this is, uh, leads us to an important distinction between the good as a substance and the metaphysical sense, which is the domain of truth, and the good as a quality which is um, uh, associated to the realm of ethics, the science of ethics, which is a practical science and the domain of action. This distinction actually will um, be also uh, will, will, be, uh, um, has important bearings on his world epistemology. In fact, the distinction between ethics and metaphysics gives us already some hints. How so? Uh, when we look at uh, Ibn Rushd, following again Aristotle on his understanding of the methods that, need, uh, that one can, uh, can use in, in ethics, he alerts us to consider first the nature of the subject matter of ethics. So obviously, when you say uh, the, the, the uh, ethics studies human action, voluntary actions, which are changing and contingent. So that nature of human action that is changing defines what kind of method you're going to use. So ethics in that sense, he discerns, cannot provide demonstrative truth based on certainty and has to accommodate the infinity and the changing and uh, um, uh, nature of human actions. And here I quote, Aristotle said, it may, it may suffice for what we are speaking about if the arguments we bring are in accordance with what is possible in the subject matter. So here, the subject matter that is uh, voluntary actions. Um, he means the premises of the inductive proofs that are for the most part and not necessary. And here he continues, they contain such an amount of difference, again, referring to this um, contin contingent nature and error since their material is possible. So ethics is associated to the realm of the possible. Therefore, it cannot be um, premised on scientific and certain uh, uh, truth, as it is the case in, in fact, metaphysics. And like theoretical sciences, uh, ethics does not rely on necessary premises, rather on what is true for the most part or what is often in um, Arabic logic referred to as widely accepted um, premises, things that are ex accepted among a community, one could say. Um, ethics does not require scientific demonstration, rather relies on general formulation. And here, by, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it's not a science. It is a science, but it doesn't need to aspire to demonstrative, to being a, a, a demonstrative science. So the general formulation are principles which are true for the most of the time, and therefore he, uh, uh, and this is where uh, uh, um, Ibn Rushd makes actually an, an important, um, one could say, um, um, uh, um, refinement to Ari uh, Aristotle's understanding of ethics, where he relates ethics to the science of dialectic. And this is where he also talks about premises. He, he links ethics to premises that are dialectical premises. So linking ethics with what is widely accepted and dovetails with the epistemology of fiqh, because also fiqh uses uh, from the perspective of the philosopher, in fact, Farabi and Averroes, it uses rhetorical and dialectical premises. That is, our premises not based on certainty, rather our premises accepted within a certain community, they're praiseworthy uh, um, premises. So how do we actually analyze ethics in the Islamic context in this sense? So it does seem the actualization of ethics is possible through virtues and law. Um, the actualization of virtues following Aristotelian is happens through the soul, obviously, 
uh, virtues are defined in relation to actions which produce a particular state in the soul. Um, as I've it's, uh, um, discussed in a, in a previous piece on Farabi, I, I kind of um, defined how, how uh, actually uh, virtues are in fact uh, related to laws. So laws in, um, uh, for Farabi are meant to provide a definition of justice that is almost a, an amount or a measure of justice in relation to a specific act and measures the amount of pleasure, pain, fear, anger uh, ascribed to a particular action. So uh, basically the different passions, which also I would say here parallels later the emotive understanding of um, uh, among the Asharites um, uh, theologians, the, this idea of linking actions to pleasure and pain. Ibn Rushd also admits that laws following Farabi are deemed as principles for virtues and provide the measure for virtues to fulfill the soul. So in a way, uh, laws um, are given an ethical content, I would argue, to virtues um, in order to actualize virtuous behavior. So through the use of uh, dialectical premises that are uh, um, basically, uh, one could say, um, things that are um, praiseworthy, that are uh, the, that are praised or bl blamed in, uh, among the a particular community. So here I give uh, to, to, to just kind of illustrate this link. So, for example, um, this is from the uh, uh, from the um, commentary, the middle commentary to Aristotle's rhetoric, um, which actually has some parallel also in the uh, in the Bidayat and Mujtahid. Um, he sets laws like, um, for example, thanking the benefactor or ibadat that are rituals. These are meant to establish excellences or virtues. So, um, in 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 general, this is kind of almost like a, a a pact between humans. The moment they accept these rituals, that's that's it, it sets them on the right path. And then you have particular laws such as related to eating, drinking, and marriage. That is uh, meant for to fulfill the, the or produce the state that is related to um, continents, Re uh, laws related to money, bodies, wars, and criminal punishment are associated to the virtue of justice. War, jihad, is uh, associated to car uh, courage and shaja, and zakat, ishtirak al amwal, as uh, he refers to um, in the Bidayat, um, actually leads toward liberality or sakha. So this is how he, this is how one can see that virtue ethics is given almost a, a, a rather concrete understanding. So you have particular laws, um, let's say here in the case of justice, uh, related to money or criminal punishment that are meant to fulfill the virtue of justice. This is at least the understanding of, of, uh, of Ibn Rushd. And obviously, again, we need to, remember, to, to bear in mind the distinction I made at the beginning between the good as a substance in the metaphysical sense and uh, virtue, the good related to the virtue that is very much specific to the uh, practical sense. So, so we have to remember that that division is important. And this understanding that is uh, very much um, rooted in the laws is uh, specifically uh, linked to uh, basically how to order society or community. Um, so Ibn Rushd's adoption of Eretaic theory, I would argue, is not premised on a dichotomy between philosophy and law. I, I think this dichotomy is not helpful when we're working on a, a medieval context. Uh, rather, I would say it is important to bear in mind all the different distinctions uh, that philosophers or theologians or whoever make in terms of ontology, epistemology, before drawing these uh, rather, uh, uh, one could say, a general statement. His ap approach, I would say, is grounded in the moral epistemological and ontological position and his conception of the normative, uh, 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 um, his own conception of the normative context in his own society. So he is thinking of how do we actualize ethics in the Muslim context. So. Um, it even gives the Eretaic theory, I would say, more concrete application by attributing particular content that is that can be measured uh, through uh, pleasure and pain, uh, and, and one could say virtues are materialized through the state produced in the soul, 
uh, through the impact of the laws and praiseworthy uh, propositions. So in that sense, I would argue his ethics, his practical ethics remain rooted in practice and not theory as it has often been um, claimed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bohafa, for this um, outstanding presentation. I'm sure it's going to provoke uh, lots of uh, questions.